Hi, good. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is David Xie Chong. Welcome to the TT Jaya FB Live. So this is episode one. So I'll be your host and moderator today. A very a three very interesting guests to share some of their experiences. So I'll introduce them one by one and share a little bit about their profile as well. First person I'd like to introduce is uh, David Hashim, David Mizan Hashim. Can you say hi, please, David? Hi, everyone. everybody. Hi. So David, hi. So David is the, the president, founding and uh, founding principal of Veritas Design Group, a leading integrated multidisciplinary design firm with a network of global offices. Right? I'll share a little bit more about his profile later. And the second speaker, Daniel Ma, Mr. Daniel Ma, the executive director of Nawawi Thai Leong. Can you say hi to everyone, Daniel? Hi, everyone. And also, we have Joshua Tan here. Joshua Tan is the founder and CEO of Troopers Malaysia. Can you say hi to everyone, Joshua? Hi, everyone. Hi. So before we start, I'll just introduce a little bit of the background of the speakers as well. So we start with David uh, Hashim. David holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a Master's in of Architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He's a corporate member and a fellow me member of the Malaysian Institute of Architects, Malaysian Institute of Interior Design, and also an associate member of the American Institute of Architects and the Boston Society of Architects. Actually, David's projects, you know, he's a very prominent architect in Malaysia and he's done projects around the world. So he has, you know, his projects has been featured very widely all around the world. And next, also a little bit about Mr. Daniel Ma Jin Yi, right? He has more than 20 years of experience in valuation, estate agency, and property management. He has been involved in valuation of various types of properties, including office buildings, malls, hotels, golf courses, plant and machinery. So he has also been involved in submissions to the Security Commission of Malaysia, Rosa Securities Malaysia and other stocks and exchanges as well, right? And we also want to like to uh, share a little bit about Joshua Tan, an entrepreneur. He is the CEO of Troopers Malaysia, and a digitally engineered solutions provider. They utilize technology and data to provide effective end-to-end -end flexible HR and uh, HR and flexible work management solutions. So they've placed more than hundred thousand headcounts across Malaysia and Thailand over the last three years and working with many big companies as well, such as Uber, Soka, and Damakan, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, with that background, all the speakers, we maybe we'll start with, um, you know, Mr. David Hashim on the topic today, recession lessons from 1987, 1998, 2008. So is COVID-19 a crisis or an opportunity? So David, maybe you would like to share some of your experiences with past from 1987? Thank you, David. Um, it's no secret that I'm the oldest person in the room, uh, which is why I've been asked to go back uh, to a time uh, before many of our audience, I think, were even born, which was back to 1986, certainly before Joshua was, was born. Yes. Right, Joshua? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, reflecting on today and reflecting on the days when I first started my business, in 1986, end of 86 and beginning of 87. I think one of the things I reflect on and have learned is that there's something about human nature in all of us that when we are experiencing a crisis of some kind, personal, business, whatever, it's difficult to imagine. It's just difficult to imagine how things could get better or how things will get better. It's just human nature. We tend to uh, be so involved and uh, depressed by the situation that we find ourselves in that it's hard to imagine. Mm. But the, the, I guess my story here and my being here today is to, if anything, give um, an indication that things change and somehow things always change for the better. It's just, it's, a, it's a, not just human nature, it's a, it's a law of uh, the universe that things will always change. Now, I take you to, a, to myself back into 1986. When uh, I first graduated from university, I had no intention to come back and work in Malaysia. Uh, I came back just to uh, say goodbye to my parents. I had a great job in New York City. Um, in Malaysia was the 1986 to 1988 commodities crisis. And let me tell you, for all your audience out there, it was much worse than things are today in Malaysia. There was nobody who had work. Uh, companies were failing. Uh, Bankruptcy was everywhere. And I came back just for a holiday to go back to New York. But my, my father, my late father said, 
son, before you go back to New York, do one thing for me. Go and ask the opinion of, of somebody who knows the industry. So I, I uh, honored my father's request and I went to, up to Ipo to meet uh, a gentleman. He was one of the founders of a development company called IGB. Uh. And I met with Datu Yap and, he, and after he heard my story, he told me, young man, going back to the United States is, would be the stupidest thing you could do. Malaysia is in the depths of a recession. There's only one thing, one way that things can go, and that is up. Things can't get any worse. You should start your business right now. You should not wait a day longer, and I guarantee you, you will be successful. And it, it was a hard thing for me to think about, but I, the more I considered his, uh, uh, his advice, the more it seemed it made sense. So finally, uh, I decided to take his advice. And... Um, I opened my practice at the end of 86 and the beginning of 87. Everybody, everybody, all my friends, all my uh, people who I was, you know, meeting socially, they were saying, you are crazy. You cannot possibly, why don't you go back to New York? You know, life is much better. This crisis was only in Malaysia. It wasn't a global crisis. It wasn't an Asian crisis. It was a Malaysian crisis. But what I found out, guys, is that, you know, rents were cheap. I could get great deals everywhere because everything was empty. Uh, I could hire great people for very little. I remember I, I was hiring graduates out of university for 800 ringgit or 900 ringgit out of university. I even got some good staff who had been uh, let go, retrenched from other companies, and they had a lot more experience than me. I had actually zero experience. Um, I should make the point here that uh, I've never had a job. It was my first job to be my own boss. So I've never worked for anybody. So it was very scary to start my own business when I had absolutely zero experience at the age of 25. But I got a secondhand car, which I got really cheap, again, because you know everyone was desperate to sell. So it was true. What uh, this gentleman had told me was absolutely true. And fortunately, I was very passionate about what I was doing. I loved my work. So I, I was putting in you know 18 hour, hour days. And I was doing some small projects. They weren't very big. But I began to build a reputation of somebody who works really hard, somebody who uh, meets deadlines. Uh, and even though I wasn't very experienced and didn't, uh, I, I could have done better than, than I should have done better. But because I made up for it by just my hard work and my commitment, I sort of got through. And I remember when I first started in 1987, January, I paid myself a salary of, I think, 1,100 ringgit. That's all we could afford. And even a few months later, I had to suspend my own salary because we couldn't afford to pay it. But somehow, you know, we got through. Um, and we grew from, from year to year. In fact, in the first few, few years, we were doubling in size every year. Mm. Well, that, doesn't, that sounds very impressive, when, except when you come to think that we began with only two people, and then four, and then eight. So doubling, <laughs> when I say doubling, it's not that impressive. But after about four or five years, we were already in our you know, a good size uh, company, and we were starting to um, make, make an impact. And I think, you know, I'm not going to talk about the future economic downturns in 1997-98. I will let uh, uh, the others here speak of that. And even the 2008 and 2009 world financial crisis, which happened much later on. But I think what I learned in the beginning, in the very beginning, in the, in the fire, in the crucible of, uh, of trying to survive, in the most difficult of times are lessons that I've, I've taken with me throughout the future crises and even the one that we are going through today. Mm. You know, um, one of the lessons is, you know, don't follow, the, don't follow the herd. When the crowd tell you go this way, maybe you should think about going the other direction. When everyone says, you know, uh, uh, you know, sell, maybe you should think about buying. When people tell you to buy, maybe you should think about selling. So, I mean, that is a really important lesson I've learned at least three times uh, in, the plat in the past 30 over years, and I'm learning the lesson right now. So the lessons I've learned in the uh, 86, 87, and 97, 98, and even 2008, 2010 crisis are the lessons that I'm bringing to my business today, mm. which is not to panic, make tough decisions, there is something called, what I call it, the, uh, the Stockdale Paradox. Uh, it refers to uh, a General Stockdale who was a prisoner in Vietnam 
war, who uh, dealt with two difficult ideas at the same time while he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam for four years. On one hand, he had to be brutally honest with his situation. Be absolutely brutally honest with yourself, with your people. Don't try to sugarcoat because people will realize that you're not telling the truth and they will stop believing you. So be brutally honest. You have to be. And, but here's the other part. Here's the hard part. At the same time that you're brutally honest, you must also hold an optimistic vision of the future. You don't know when that future can be. It could be June. It could be December. It could be 2022. We're not sure. I can't tell you what it is, but I can tell I can say one thing, and I tell this to all my people, eventually, we're going to be out of this because I've done it before. I've gone through this before. When everyone said we're in hell, I can tell you, we're going to rise. And if you're smart and you play your cards right and you save your pennies, you will be at the top when it comes time to grow again. Because at some point, the sun will come up, the seed will put through the cut through the ground, and the tree will grow again. Sure. You better be the person who's got the seeds and the water and ready to nurture that tree when it's ready to grow. A lot of people give up. A lot of people think they're just going to put their seeds into the bank and be done with it. I, I won't fault them because maybe they're at that time of their life, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I never give up. I always yeah. say that uh, tomorrow is always going to be better. So think about this uh, This what I call the Stockdale Paradox. You can look it up. Okay. Yeah, so I'll leave it with that, and maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about some of my property uh, uh, um, uh, explorations uh, later on, perhaps. Uh, so okay, back sure, to you, sure. David. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you, David Hashem. I mean, I think we will come back a little bit about some of those lessons as well, your leadership lessons and, you know, the resilience as well a bit later. All right, thank you for sharing a little bit about the 1986-87, you know, situation back then my first experiences. Maybe Mr. Daniel Ma. Daniel, would you be able to share a little bit about 98, uh, the situation 97, 98? You know, your experiences, what were you doing and, you know, some personal stories, please, perhaps? Sure, sure, David. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, for my crisis, it will be starting somewhere in 1997. I think during 1997, that was my last year of uh, uh, university where I was in Australia, uh, Adelaide. So uh, actually, when the crisis happened was somewhere in July. That is when the Thai uh, baht devalue. Uh, this is where the uh, Asian financial crisis started, uh, because I think that time uh, Thai Thailand was uh, laden with a lot of foreign debts. Uh, mm. Then they have to float their dollars. Uh, they have to float their baht against the dollars, and then mm. this have a uh, ripple effect not only in Thailand. Uh, that also caused a collapse uh, in Korea, South Korea, and Indonesia. These three countries were uh, uh, quite badly hit. Uh, we first received the news while I was doing a, a last semester's thesis on the uh, Asian economies on property mm. impact. So that was in my last uh, uh, quarter of the semester in '97. So uh, I also visited uh, Bangkok in '97 during my year end one of the projects uh, in somewhere in August. So the effect was already uh, quite evident in, in Bangkok. Uh, so uh, because of the uh, these three countries, uh, the impact was so great. Malaysia was not spared. So Malaysia also went through a very difficult uh, uh, period. Uh, but so happens when uh, when I graduate in December and I came back. Uh, uh, during the Christmas, uh, situation was already quite evident in Malaysia as well. Mm. Uh, so I think there was a, a, a stock market uh, continued to slide down. Uh, jobs were, were a few because uh, most of the companies are running very difficult uh, cash flow. Uh, so in 90, 1998, beginning January up to March, I did make an application for uh, jobs in Singapore because I'm a Johor. I was born in Johor, so I came back uh, to Jobaru looking for a job on the other side of the country, which is uh, in Singapore, because uh, the, the, the Sing dollar was uh, much attractive then. Uh, I sent out about close to 50 resumes to all the properties, uh, uh, whether it's a listed company or whether it's a non-listed <laughs> property company. I managed to send out 50 resumes. 
but the answer I, re I received from all these 50 companies were only two companies. The, the only thing that they written in the reply letter was to keep me informed if there's any vacancies available. So that was quite a dire situation because I have almost 50 uh, rejection uh, from all the companies I sent to. So that was quite tough to find a job in Johor Bahru as well. So then I managed to uh, 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 get a vacancy somewhere in Kuala Lumpur as a valuer. Uh, so without hesitation, uh, I, I drove almost 300 kilometers up to KL uh, to start as a valuation executive uh, in March 1998. Salary was not 800 then. <laughs> uh, salaries were starting around 1002 to 2003. So it actually uh, uh, improved almost uh, by 500 ringgit uh, compared to David Hashin time. Uh, but it's nevertheless, it's still quite low. Uh, the starting pay was 1000 to 2003. So the uh, situation was quite uh, dire at this uh, Asian financial crisis. I remember the stock market was down nearly below 300 uh, 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 points. Uh, and every time uh, uh, our, our Prime Minister spoke uh, over the TV or, or live, uh, the share market will drop. That is how, how bad uh, the situation is. And, and there was pretty much nothing on the streets, uh, I remember, because driving along the streets of KL was quite uh, non congested because most of the car was repossessed at that time. Mm. Because a lot of people lost uh, their... their their jobs uh, mm. and also they lost a lot of money in stocks. Mm. So situation was quite bad. Uh, in terms of uh, valuation, uh, I think I hardly do more than uh, four to five reports per month. Uh, mm. Because at that time, I think the banks are not financing. The interest rate was pretty high. It was almost like 10 to 11% at that point mm. of time. So I think hardly people take any loans. Uh, but of course, if you have cash, I believe that is a, a, a wonderful thing because your interest rate uh, from the fixed deposit was almost uh, 10%. But if you borrow a lot of money, uh, that will be quite a, a worrying sign because you need to pay almost a 10% interest. So that was quite a bad situation uh, in 97. Yeah. So that's my personal experience. Uh, it takes almost about, if I can remember, uh, when it crashed, our GDP was almost below 7.4% deficit. But it's, uh, it, it did rebound in the subsequent year in 1999, almost to about 6%. So as what uh, uh, we know that every crisis, uh, there will be a silver lining at the end. So it did rebound. Uh, that is a good uh, indication that uh, uh, once the crisis is over, I think uh, things will get on a recovery path. That's my personal experience, yeah. Mm, okay. So to sum up right now for the first and second uh, panelists and speaker, it's very interesting. You have David Hashim, you know, he came in 1987, 86, 87, and started his own business, his entrepreneurial journey. And Mr. Daniel Ma as well, I know in 1998, started his first job and, you know, went on to become very successful in senior management. So we'll go back later a little bit about, you know, some of their job experiences and you know, how they managed to go, sail through. Before that, maybe we'll go to Joshua. Joshua, would you like to share some of your experiences as well, you know, during the crisis, uh, right? Yeah, um, thank you, David. Um, yep. So I think on my end, a lot of what I can share about is, I think, my own personal uh, story, maybe how it affected me uh, on a personal and on a family level. Yeah. Uh, because maybe uh, as, as many of you guys may, may know, uh, in 97, I was uh, only, you know, uh, six years old, right? Six to seven years old. So, um, but actually 97 had uh, a lot of impact on me and my family because uh, my family lost a lot of money in 97. Uh, so, you know, my trajectory or maybe, you know, my life as a, as a person growing up was affected, right? Um, so... Uh, what I learned through 97 was that not to take risk, right? When, when you take risk and, uh, you know, a recession happened, uh, it's negative. So as, you, as I share a little bit uh, about what I'm going to say, I will, I will be able to maybe let you guys know how that perspective has changed or it has evolved over time. So do remember that in 97, you know, my parents told me or, you know, my family members told me, don't take risk, right? Don't invest, you know, don't invest in shares, don't uh, invest in things. Uh, work hard, get a job, right? That is uh, what you can do for yourself. That would be the best thing. And find a job that is recession-proof, 
that is a, a common Chinese uh, saying, right? I grew up in a very traditional Chinese family. So uh, in 2008, that was when, uh, contrary to Daniel, he, he was in his last year, I was in my first year, uh, I was studying in Hong Kong, right? So I was studying economics and finance, and uh, during the 2008 uh, world financial crisis, um, my family was in Vietnam, and Vietnam was badly hit uh, because of the, and my family was in the property market, right? So the property market in Vietnam was badly hit in 2008, and, um, you know, uh, that affected my, my, my studies as well. Right, so to a certain extent, right? So, uh, but from 2008, what I learned was that while as a young person, I was taught to not take risk. In 2008, uh, as a, a person that's studying economics and finance, mm-hmm. I've noticed that uh, during a recession or during a, a crisis, there's mm-hmm. opportunities that abound, right? So let's take, for me back then, I took the the equities market as a comparison, right? So I view the equities market or a lot of people view the equities market as a zero-sum game. If someone wins, someone needs to lose, right? And everyone or maybe the majority of the population would like to think that, oh, you know, share market during crisis, actually a lot of people lose money, right? Uh, And it's very bad. But from my experience in 2008, I realized that actually the equities market is abound with opportunities if you know Uh, how to take those opportunities, right? So um, by learning that, and in in 2008, what it has uh, gave me the realization is that only those people that are not equipped or those that are not equipped with the knowledge, with the skill sets and the know-how would feel that the, uh, um, you know, a crisis or recession is a problem. If you have the right knowledge, you have the right skill sets and you prepare yourself uh, adequately, then you'll be able to capitalize uh, on opportunities, right? Uh, so I think I go back to uh, David's question, is, is COVID-19 uh, uh, opportunity or a crisis? I personally, uh, I currently run um, Troopers, right? I also run three other businesses uh, in f and in parking, as well as a digital agency. Um, I feel that this is a great opportunity, right, uh, for a lot of my businesses, Right, so I give you some example. Uh, for Troopers, we are a flexible part-time uh, work uh, provider. Right, uh, we are digitally based, and a lot of our projects surrounds uh, providing manpower for events. So, as you may know, currently no events are running because uh, social distancing is a, is is a thing, and uh, you know a close contact is not encouraged. But I view that as an opportunity to pivot my business. So in the startup space, we use the word pivot quite a lot, right? So if your current business model doesn't work, you pivot to something else. So I view this as a great opportunity to pivot my business to provide and start up a a food delivery um, platform, right? Uh, And utilize my part-time workers to work with local hawkers and, um, you know, match the gap, right? Bring lower service fees, cover a smaller area, but you create jobs and you support local businesses. So that was the pivot that I did, right? Uh, for my F&B business, for my parking business, you know, for parking, it's obviously going to be affected because, um, you know, uh, no one's going to park. But what we did was to get people to prepay uh, to park in the future, right, at a lower rate. So, you know, we bring in cash today, right? For my F&B business, I, I, I uh, managed to get my team to be more agile, right, to cater more for the online market, you know, utilize delivery platforms. So... I, I definitely view this as an uh, opportunity, and I think that a lot of what I've learned, uh, you know, growing up, um, has been um, not hundred percent true. Uh, I think like what uh, Mr. David Hashim has mentioned as well. I think to each their own. You know, some people feel that you know during a crisis, uh, you may want to protect, keep what you have, right? Uh, but there will be some people as well. Um, you know, maybe entrepreneurs or people that are willing to take more risk will say, "Hey, this is an opportunity for me to go out." right, and, and, and start a business or put myself out there and take some risky decisions, you know, because I have nothing to lose anyways. You know, if, if I'm currently in a job and I've lost my job and I have nothing to lose, then uh, why not? Let's go give it a try. Um, maybe just before I end, just something I wanted to share as well. Um, I, before I started doing my business, I was a consultant in uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Okay. Uh, we were doing a lot of reviews for, for conglomerates, right? But before I started my job, uh, my executive director asked me this question. It was a case study, right? And they asked me, uh, and I think it's very relevant to the current uh, topic we're talking about. 
Um, so you have a family business. Uh, they're in a difficult position due to the economy right now. They're in a furniture business. Uh, one, one person you know, in, the, in the business said, you know, we want to expand. We want to be very aggressive in our marketing efforts, right? Uh, in our sales, we want to come up with um, more promotions and stuff. Um, the other uh, party said, you know, they wanted to be more conservative. They want to protect what they have, right? And write the period truth, right? So I looked at that question and um, the, the interviewer asked me and said, you know, Joshua, if, if a client came to you and asked you, you know, what would your strategy be, right? In uh, what would be your advice throughout uh, this, this process? Mm. I think my initial reaction would be, you know, my, my answer to him, while it can seem very vague, my, my straight up answer is there is no perfect way. There's no right way. Right? It really depends on what your appetite is and most importantly, what your skill sets are. I think opportunities are always abound. Right? Uh, and the question I've always asked myself growing up is, oh, why, why, why do I don't, you know, the opportunity presented itself, but why couldn't I take it? You know, why didn't I get an opportunity? I think we shouldn't ask the question of why I did not get the opportunity. We should ask the question, how can I take that opportunity? Right? It's about equipping yourself with the skill sets, the knowledge, the network and preparing yourself to able to capitalize on this opportunity. So if anyone today is in a situation where they are not able to capitalize on the opportunity, let's just say they don't have sufficient cash to go and purchase a house or, a pitch or do some investment that would give them you know, exponential return in the rebound of this crisis, it's okay. Prepare yourself because there will be other opportunities that come. And at the end of the day, uh, there's no right answer, right? It's up to you uh, in terms of your risk appetite as well as you know um, you know what are your commitments and, and stuff like that so uh, I don't think that's a one size fit all um, I think whatever that I'm sharing here today or whatever we are sharing is just going to be something that you can consider if you if you put yourself within a particular bracket of you know wanting to be an entrepreneur or you know wanting to be a more successful uh, person that does investment so um, I guess that would be my that that would be my uh, contribution to this back to you sure. David. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for some of your personal sharing as well as, you know, from a you know, young entrepreneur's perspective and also a little bit of perspective of, you know, what you went through during the previous crises. Okay, very interesting. I mean, perhaps I will share a little bit of statistics, right, that I have. I mean, very, very general, right? Okay, so back to the topic today. The topic today is, you know, recession lessons, right? Is this a crisis or an opportunity, particularly in this COVID-19 pandemic situation? Now, I have um, four statistics here, right? The first statistic says this, the Malaysian Retailers Association, or MRA, says they envisage a 90% drop in sales. Okay, that's one. Number two, SME Association of Malaysia, SME, right? They mentioned that only 38, uh, 33% of their members have enough cash flow to pull through in March. And then for the rest of them, about 38% says that they can only sustain themselves until April. And now we're at the end of April already. Okay, third, the Malaysia Employers Federation, right, for employers, right, said unemployment could reach up to 2 million, okay, 2 million, which is about an unemployment rate of 13%, okay, 2019, unemployment is only about 3.4%, okay. Last, last one, number four, point number four, right, the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, FMM, says that they indicate their members, right, about 78% would need to lay off or retrench up to 30% of their employees. So at this moment for Malaysia in lockdown, in MCO lockdown, these are some you know, predictions that they, they are saying that we may be going through right, right now and in the near future. So I'd like to pose some questions to maybe David Hashim and so Daniel Ma, right? So maybe to David Hashim, I'll ask about, you know, let's say if you're a business owner or SME, right? You know, how do, can they you know, um, you know, face this issue? And I'll thereafter go back to Mr. Daniel Ma from an employee perspective. And thereafter, I'll go to Joshua as well. So, Mr. David Hashim, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, right, you've been through a few crises, right? You know, you have, you know, very tough lessons, right? A, a lot of experience. So, what is your take for current business or SME owners, right? If they're facing a challenge, an issue, right? Maybe they're facing a crisis. How do they turn this around to an opportunity? Okay. Um... I think it's a lot of it, uh, there's so many factors at play here. Um, I think what's important for every individual and for every family is to have a, an absolute minimum amount of reserves so that uh, whatever happens uh, in your businesses, that it will not, your, your life will not be go below a certain 
uh, standard uh, of living, okay? So for everybody has a different standard of what that figure is. Uh, and I would urge everybody to make sure that some part of what your uh, assets are, are safe. And that figure is different for the age that you are. If you're a young person just starting off in life, eh, it's nothing, which means what the hell, go for it. There, there, there's nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're an, an older person, maybe you have a family, then you have to start thinking about what are those minimum resources, whether it's in your EPF or in savings or in some family home asset that you can always uh, turn to in the worst situation. Mm -hmm. Now, once you've set what that is, you then have everything above that. Uh, and that is what you have to gamble with. I hate to use the word gamble because gamble uh, tends to suggest that uh, uh, it's equal chance of winning or losing. That's what gambling is. But a true entrepreneur doesn't gamble. A true entrepreneur knows what they're doing. They look at themselves. They look at their own. Joshua used the term skill set, individual skill set. I think that's a very important place to start. What is an individual's skill set? What is unique about you? Maybe it's uh, not who you know, but uh, sorry, what you know, but maybe you also who you know. That, that's part of life as well. You may have um, uh, some unique uh, knowledge or experience and know some unique uh, individuals, and that's already the beginning of your, of your journey, right? Mm. Or you may have a passion. You may have a passion. It could have been in, in sports, or it could have been in baking, or it could have been in you know, building uh, friendships and uh, building groups of uh, people to get together and having parties. Each of these can potentially be a business, any one of them. Now, in a, in a world where everything seems to be falling around, around you, uh, those, those statistics that you mentioned, David, are scary statistics. But those are, for, those are statistics of established companies, yeah. right? Those are businesses that have been around. So if 33% are failing, then, and if you're get, just getting started, you could be that business that fills up the space of those 33% that are disappearing. But you better be smarter. You better have the better uh, uh, cake, or you better have the better distribution of cake. You better have the best location. You better be the best cake maker, or whatever it is, you know? Um, and using the new digital tools. Now, that's the other thing. Older companies, uh, may not be as, you know, as uh, digitally uh, um, knowledgeable as younger people today or as smaller companies today. So the bigger companies are slow to take notice of the opportunities. Even if they see it right in their face, they can't move. They can't make a decision. Mm -hmm. Younger companies, individuals who are just starting off can make all the decisions themselves um, mm -hmm. and can get started in new businesses to replace but replace those companies. Like, for example, we talked about the event management business. Josh also mentioned event management. The old style of event management, hey, it's gone. And I think it's going to take a long time to come back, organizing conferences in big public gatherings. But there's a lot of young, dynamic new companies out there creating webinars and Zoominars and are going to start making money because they're doing it differently. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I'll sum up a little bit. So, you know, for you, your advice would be minimum, you know, safety net, right? Assess the age, you know, what sort of risk ability you'll be able to take and also move up and improve, yeah? Find your niche, you know, you use your advantage to, to, to your advantage. Okay, thank you for the share. Now, um, Daniel, right? Daniel, I mean, you shared a little bit about, you know, 97, 98, you just started your job. So, for example, for young graduates today, let's say they just graduated, okay? So, you know, for employees as well, so what advice could you give them, for example, if their company, you know, their job security is affected, right? And also, for example, maybe you could share a little bit about, you know, your secrets of getting that job, you know, despite so many interviews, etc. So overall, perhaps what sort of advice could you give to employees? Right. Daniel, do you have anything to share? Okay. Uh, I think as a fresh grad uh, coming out into this uh, working sector, uh, they are young, they are 25 ish to 30 uh, age group. I think they have nothing to lose as what Joshua has mentioned. Uh, the younger generation of today, they are more uh, digitally uh, savvy. Uh, compared to my generation back in 97, 98, uh, we are, I think there's a generation gap there. Uh, 
as I mentioned, 25, 30 year old, I think uh, your commitment is not that, that high compared to if, if you are somewhere around 35 to 45 age group. I think you have start maybe uh, uh, bought more properties. Uh, you have a uh, rich uh, 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 investments of uh, uh, whether it's in properties, whether you have uh, cars, whether your children's education, you have highly committed. Whereas the younger fresh grad, they have nothing to lose. The commitments are quite low. Uh, but yet, if there's a situation where you get retrenchment or you get layoffs, yes. or perhaps you work in one of the worst hit sector like hospitality sector and mm. this hot hotel industry where you are one of the uh, waiter or waitresses or you're one of mm. the uh, working in the F&B section of the hotels. Mm. Because of the tech sector is badly hit, I think uh, most of the hotel operation either is temporary closed or it's mm. permanent closed. Uh, yes. So you are one of the badly affected, uh, one of the staff in layoff, what can you do? Uh, your saving is not that high because you just started work for one year or could mm. be uh, uh, two years. Uh, but yet, perhaps uh, you just bought your first car. Uh, so the situation uh, will be quite uh, uh, serious because their savings are quite low. Uh, what can they do? Uh, I think at this moment also, I don't think many companies are employing uh, uh, many people uh, of, of, because we're totally shut down. Uh, Unless you are one of the person like you described by Joshua, you are you have uh, during this time you find that is you need to capitalize on opportunity. Think of something out of the box you can do. Uh, you 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 uh, uh, perhaps during this free time you have a lot of ideas that evolving uh, new businesses uh, on a digital platform. I think that may be going uh, a long way. Uh, on a digital platform, as you can see, e-commerce is doing that well. But if you're on a 35 to 40 year, 45 uh, age group, uh, I think that is where it's quite scary. Uh, or you are in a 50 year old uh, age group where you, you you are owning a company, you have salaries to be paid off. I mm. think, uh, and during these two months, you're not getting any cash flow. So mm. <laughs> that is quite a worrying sign. Huh? Mm. Uh, I think for either is it, you are a fresh grad, whether you are an employee of a company uh, or whether you are an employer of the company. I think everybody is, is, is living this uh, unprecedented crisis. Uh, I should say it's a crisis now. Uh, it's not uh, totally, uh, uh, not many people will see opportunity, but because we are living in a real crisis, because we are feeling the pinch of it every day, uh, mm. The only good news is that the government announced a six-month moratorium, uh, which mm. has helped a lot of SME company, uh, mm. a lot of employers, a lot mm. of uh, 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 employees who have borrowed from banks, either is it for uh, car financing or whether is it property financing. Uh, this six-month moratorium actually give them a, a, breath, a breathing space uh, mm. temporarily to actually uh, to regroup their financing. Uh, I agree with David Hashim. Very important to have a savings. Uh, if you are a fresh grad, you still need to save some uh, for rainy days, whether it's a 10%, 20%, 30%. It's the savings that is the reserve that helps you to pull through a crisis period. Uh, if you do not have a savings, then you'll find it very, very tough to actually go through a crisis period. So I do agree with David. A savings or reserve is very critical to help you to any crisis. Mm. Okay. That is my view. Sure, sure. So basically to try to think out of the box, right, if you're in certain sectors and look at, you know, to go digital as much as possible, right, Daniel, and, you know, to keep some savings. Yes, has, definitely. Uh, you need to keep some savings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Joshua, you know, I'm just wondering, right, in this sort of situation in, in 2020, this pandemic is, is, is new, you know, nobody has... You know, looked at something like that. All those previous 1987, 98, 2008, those are more financial type of crisis, or economic crisis. Here we have a pandemic. So let's say for your peer groups, right, people around your age, what, what are they feeling out there? You know, what's the situation out there? How do they feel it? How do they survive? I, I think, you know, uh, just to share a little bit in terms of, you know, the unprecedented nature of the current crisis, right? Uh, I think I'm very blessed that uh, a lot of my business, or actually all my businesses, I work with partners, 
Mm. My partners are actually some of my very good friends. Uh, mm. Some of them are even, you know, I'm, I'm the godfather to their children, right? Um, I, I believe that, you know, uh, as well as my mentors, you know, we have, we have mentors in my company. So I, 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 I decided to bring them on because I feel that as an individual, I realized that I need experience, you know, uh, whatever knowledge I have, which is limited, only bring me as far. But if I really want to go far and serious and to take things into, you know, the next level, I need mentors. And, you know, I've always kept them abreast in terms of, you know, what we are doing, the decisions that we are making, whether or not they are right or wrong. And I think one of the most consistent things that they've told me is, you know, Josh, don't let us hold you back. Don't allow our opinions or our experience to hold you back because that may do you more harm than good, mm. right? Uh, so take what you need and run with it. But, you know, um, you should really trust yourself. So I think in terms of the sentiment of young people out there today, um, let, me, let me speak for the general public. I mean, just for me as, a, as an individual, I, I'm extremely blessed. Because, uh, you know, I, somehow I listened to my mom, right? And she told me to save money. Save. I always ask her, why save, right? So I'm, I'm very thankful that I have such sufficient savings today, you know, to, to go through the next 18 to 24 months uh, if my business go bust even today, right? Um, but I think the general sentiment out there is actually quite bad because people are not sure what to do, right? Those that, are, have, those that have a job, uh, not happy because uh, maybe their salaries are getting cut and stuff like that. Those that don't have a job are going to struggle to find a job, right? Uh, unless they, again, upgrade their skill sets. Let it be, go online, learn a new course, take up a new skill, right? Make themselves valuable in a, in, a, in a new normal. That's what the, the saying is, right? If they can make themselves relevant in a new normal, then yes, you know, uh, it will be a great opportunity for them. But I think the general sentiment with a lot of people out there is uh, it's, it's negative, right? I think at the start of this MCU, everyone was like, oh, you know, yay, holiday, you know, and still get paid. But I think after a while, people start to realize that that's not really the case, right? Um, for my peers that are in business, I think, uh, again, I'm very honored and fortunate to, to share a lot of uh, similar values with my partners. So I think we are all on the same trajectory as well and we see this as an opportunity. So uh, like I mentioned, I'm aggressively hiring right now. I'm hiring the, some of the best people from industry uh, because you know, uh, other companies cannot afford to keep them around. And uh, I think as a business, uh, we have been very um, blessed to know that you know, uh, we have made good financial decisions. So what I want to come back to is that I think a lot of what will determine how we do currently is what we have planned previously. So a lot of companies have planned to do aggressive expansion, right? Um, sometimes borderline financially irresponsible, right? And then, you know, a, a financial crisis come and they say, you know, uh, I expect a bailout. You should help me out. Government should do their role. I, I think as business, we should make good financial decisions right? Uh, and say, you know, we need to keep for rainy days as well. Not only as individuals, I think as business people, as young entrepreneurs, we cannot say we raise 500,000 and we spend all within the next three months and, you know, whatever happens after, so be it. You know, so uh, we recently raised our funds as well, and, but, but we didn't touch one cent of it because we didn't need to, right? Uh, so I think making good planning, making good financial decisions is important. And I think as young people, as individuals, sadly, I think Malaysia is one of the highest debt Base uh, society, a lot of our people live off credit, right? Let it be personal loans, let it be credit cards. Uh, we live off that. I think one of my biggest advice to any young person is don't get a credit card until you're financially stable because the credit card is just going to do you more harm than good, right? So if you have more cash, you have more savings, even though you don't live as much of a luxury lifestyle, so be it because you know, you, you will get more opportunities in the future to be able to do more things. I think I just want to leave uh, my share with one last thing, right? I think even the past two years, everyone would say, oh, the economy is going to do very bad, you know, and stuff like that. But when I go to the airports, when, I, when Apple launches a new product, mm -hmm. you, you see a lot of people purchasing, lining up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. People going for travels. So I, I think the general, maybe the general sentiment of a lot of people is that, you know, um, guys, pagi, makan pagi. I think that's the saying, right? We are very much, you know, hand to mouth and mm -hmm. we don't really make... Uh, you know, good financial decisions. So I think uh, maybe, you know, we should be educated even in, in school, you know, how to manage our finances, how to be financially responsible. Then I think as a society and as a community, as a nation, 
um, you know, we, we can rise up stronger and face any crisis uh, more, more readily prepared. So I think, I think that would be me. But, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I think for young people, we should not be, we should not be bleak. We should not be unduly worried, right? Uh, I think as mentioned by, by David and Daniel as well, you know, uh, we are young. We have nothing much to lose, right? Uh, uh, there's only, the only way is up now, right? Uh, so keep a positive mental attitude and uh, keep hustling. That, that has been my, mot okay. um, my motto for the past, every, I don't know, you know, years, you know, hustle, find a way, never give up. Uh, I think that would be my, my, my input to, to anyone listening out there. Sure, sure. Thanks for that. I mean, very interesting thing about, you know, uh, uh, the, the thing I'm getting for all three of you is that, you know, cash reserves, savings, you know, this you know, save for a rainy day. All these are actually, you know, buffers in case of anything that happens, right? In the line of what Joshua has said as well, but at this moment, uh, Malaysia's household debt is about 80 plus percent right, in 20, based on 2019. Household debt is quite high, yeah? To GDP and by 80 plus percent. But at this time of tough time and crisis, right? I mean, David, you, you, you know, is there any opportunity, for example, let's, maybe let's go back to a little bit, on, you're, you're an architect by profession, maybe a little bit to the property market, right? Uh, in these tough times, etc., and also based on previous tough times, right? 87, you know, 98, 2008. Are there any opportunities or what's it like in the property market? You know, do they need courage to uh, invest, etc.? Could you share a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Malaysia has gone through literally 12, 10 to 12 years of prosperity. Um, so it's very hard for young people to appreciate that there is a time when things can change uh, for the worse. Uh, when you're grown up uh, and every year a GDP is in the positive territory uh, between, you know, four to seven percent GDP over the last 10 years. It's hard to imagine that uh, things can change uh, uh, drastically, but, but they can. And, and, and that's what we're seeing today. Um, to young people today, uh, if they have any means to, um, to, to save, if they have, I mean, those people like uh, Joshua described who are out of a job today and they've just started, obviously they won't have any savings. Uh, and the advice I would give to them would be slightly different. But going back to when I was a young man at the age of, I think about two years after I started working, I was 27. And um, because I was in the property business, uh, I could see that uh, things were already starting to inch up. Uh, the bottom, it had already bottomed out. Um, uh, but I still couldn't really afford property. I couldn't afford uh, property. I had only been working for a couple of years. And when you're paying yourself only 1,100, or I think it went up to 1,005 uh, ringgit a month, there isn't much you can save. So I made a deal. I had a land, I went to a landlord mm -hmm. and I said, look, I, I can't aff afford to buy your two bedroom apartment. This was in Ampang Jaya, okay? Because uh, uh, I like that area, Ampang Jaya. I said, you know, I can't afford your two bedroom apartment, but how about this? I'll pay you a rent, maybe just a little bit higher than what you're expecting. But we make an agreement that, that part of my rent goes toward uh, purchasing your property. Now, this, this landlord had no choice because he hadn't uh, found a tenant for so long. He said, whatever, he was ready to agree to anything. So um, I made a deal with him. And after about two years of being his uh, tenant, I finally was able to, you know, scrape enough money together to pay a small deposit and get a loan on the balance. And that was my first property. It was about 110,000 ringgit, mm -hmm. uh, a two bedroom apartment in Ampang Jaya. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the lesson I learned from that, I got into the, I, so I got into the property game early. And within about, I think about four years later, uh, I, I sold that. And I made more than double my money in about four years, which is a damn good investment because the property deal that I did was at the bottom. And I didn't sell it at the top, but I, I don't think any uh, investor can buy at the very bottom and sell at the very top. It's just not gonna happen. You just do the best you can. And I got a good price and I sold it for double what I bought it for. And I think, and then I went on to do similar kind of uh, investments over time. So I, yes, because I'm in the property business, I have a certain uh, insight to where and what and pricing of properties that would be, be good. And so my advice to young people today is that if you can get into the property um, uh, investment uh, 
route, uh, do so quickly. And I want to share a slide here, if I can, David. Do I have time to share a slide? Yeah, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a slide um, that I, I put together, uh, which describes why it's important to get into the property game early. If you can all see this, what it shows is that over time, salaries go up, but not that, not, they don't go up as fast as property values increase. So over time, the longer you wait to get into an ownership of property, the more the gap will be between what your salary or income will be and what property values are. So the thing to do is to get in as early as possible in time so that you can enjoy the wave of property value increase. It's a lesson I've learned myself, and um, I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a property guru, but uh, I think it's pretty common sense. So I'm, I'm pleased to say I've done pretty well by this simple rule of thumb. Get into the game early, um, and then trade up. Trade up when you can, whenever you can. And now is back to the time when you can get the most incredible deals now. You know, uh, you can buy uh, property that's at the launch price, even after it's launched a few years ago, all right? I doubt that many, many properties will be selling below their launch price unless they're really, really in crisis. And then you have to question whether it's a good investment because there's something wrong with a property. Uh, if it's too low, there could be something wrong. So do your research, find out what's going on. You know, uh, there could be some serious issues with the building, with the JMB uh, and so on. So be careful. But property has always made Malaysians wealthy. So that is my advice to everyone. Thank you. So in essence, a property, I mean, if they hold it for over time, I, I'm guessing because one of the message that I'm, and I'm hearing for all three of you is saving. So would it be a form of savings as well? If they hold it over, over like 10 years, 20 years, David? I'm well, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's also a form of uh, forced savings. I mean, when you have to pay a mortgage, uh, you're not going to go run out and buy that latest Apple phone just because it's out there and it's sexy, you know? Um, most of the things young Malaysians buy are depreciate so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out and buy a new Apple. What does it cost, Joshua? A thousand five? I don't know. Uh, the latest one, maybe two thousand? Two thousand three, four thousand, I think. Okay, right. <laughs> so, See, I don't know because I don't buy that. Sure, um, sure. And as soon as you own it, a week later, it's worth half the price. Yeah. I mean, it's why do you do that? Why do young Malaysians buy fancy <laughs> clothes, buy fancy cars? These things depreciate so fast. Whereas every ringgit you put into property, appreciates as long as you buy the right property. And this is where you need to, um, you know, uh, do your research. Another thing I think Joshua said, which is very correct, is uh, learn something, learn a, something new. I mean, the property business is easy to learn. There's a lot of uh, uh, resources there out uh, in the internet and uh, your friends. Your friends are a great resource. Your friends are often the best resource. Uh, your friends can be your business partners. You could, you could co-invest with them. And I've done a lot of investing. With, uh, with smart uh, people, you share ideas. Uh, you know, when you get together, even if you can't meet at Kopitiam, you can still meet over a Zoom and talk about, hey, some ideas to, how about that, that thing? Or how about this other idea? And you, before you know it, MCO is lifted and you've got, you've got some, some, some ideas on your, uh, under your belt to go with, you know? I, I would just like to quickly add on to uh, what um, Mr. David Hashim was uh, speaking about uh, investing. Right. Uh, something to share with you. Uh, my some of my actually this is one of my mentors. He told me how he started in the property market was that he didn't have enough money to to buy a property. So he actually pulled together money with two three other friends. Again, you know, it's it really depends how much you trust your friend and stuff like that. But how he did it was he pulled money together with a few friends, right? And then they brought a property together. Right, and then um, that's how they got their start. Right, uh, this was something that is very prevalent in Hong Kong as well. Uh, countries where property prices are too expensive, and your salary—if you take a job—you'll never be able to to buy one. Right, or if you buy one, you 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 probably don't. You know, you're not probably going to be able to fully pay for it, uh, even until you you pass on. Right, so I I think coming back to the investment point, I I think making good decisions is important. You need to learn. I think while the property market is easy to learn, I think for me, like a young person, I just got into the property market the back end of last year. It's, it probably wasn't a good timing because, you know, with now how everything is, maybe I should have saved up and gone in now. But like you mentioned as well, I think there's never a time where you can say, you know, uh, I bought at the lowest and I'm going to sell at the highest. You, you make the best decision based on where you are at at that moment, right? Uh, and you make decisions based on what 
um, your requirements are, whether you're investing, whether you're looking to buy to stay and stuff like that. But I think for me, for, for a young person, what I would share with anyone that's looking to, to purchase a property is um, decide well what you want to do the property, what you want to use the property for. Is it for you to, to, to purchase for investment? Are, are you purchasing it to live for your future? Uh, and I think that will guide uh, your, your, your purchasing habit and, and what you want to do. And I think there's a lot of... Uh, promotions out there or even incentives for people to get into the, the market early because tying it back to being a debt-based uh, society, I think a lot of us are used to the notion that, you know, um, to buy a house, you need to lend money, but uh, there is a need to pay upfront and the charges and stuff as well. So it comes back to learning about what are some of the costs that are associated with purchasing a house uh, and then uh, going out there to research some of the values or promotions they can get. Right to have a low entry to, to purchase a, a property. I think uh, information is all out there. It's about you know going out and doing your research and speaking to your friends and, and the right people as well. I think a good piece of advice I can give anybody out there is make friends like Daniel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just about to ask him. I mean, Daniel, from a valuation perspective, right, uh, from a property consultancy, so what is your take? Maybe could you share a little bit as well, you know, property prices, you know, every time there's a crisis, 87 to the next point of uh, 97, 98 and 2008, like now, I mean, normally how, how does the graph move and what is your take on this? Uh, okay, very simple, because when there's an economy crisis or financial crisis, the, fall, the property sector will always follow uh, probably three to six months where there's a downturn in uh, property cycle. Uh, that's quite evident because we are three to six months behind the economy. Uh, then you will see some uh, desperate selling by some of the owners, uh, some of uh, the uh, property uh, owners who want to let go uh, because they couldn't survive at that period. Uh, mm. That is quite evident in 1997 and 1998 uh, because I'm, I'm well aware of that situation because uh, during that time, uh, my dad in fact, holds a lot of properties uh, in Johor Bahru. And uh, I can say that the market value and the rental value uh, both went down as high as 50 to 70%. Uh, the property could worth 1 million for a double story shop in an outskirt fringe of JB City Center. And it could crash to almost below 500,000. That is almost 50% down of the value. Uh, yes, uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, Pre-crisis, before 97, a lot of people are making tons of money during the property boom. When it went bust, uh, it also affects a lot of property investors. Uh, simply because when property value goes down, your rental value goes down as well. So take, for example, if you are renting to a, 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 a tenant and suddenly he exited uh, during the crisis and mm. you are unable to rent out the unit. At the same time, you have a borrowing financing and during that time, which is about 10 to 11%, and you're unable to rent out or to pay, uh, the tenant unable to pay to you. So just multiply by five to 10 properties alone, that would definitely kill you. That would be a very worrying sign for you. And that is the real situation in 1998 crisis because during that time, the boom time, a lot of people buy in, in the property because they make tons of money from the stock market. They went into the property because riding the property boom. So they inherit a lot of property, but it, most I can, I'm, I'm sure they are uh, buying for investment rather than stay. So they could have easily owns five to 10 property at one time. So when the crisis happened, this actually because affects them because the borrowing cost is very high. Unless you buy the property through cash, you're not affected. But if you are borrowing from bank, I'm sure even a 50 to 60% loan, that will actually uh, put your financial into instability. So that is, was the crisis. And for Johor Bahru, it's a, it's a, a, a very unique situation because not uh, the recovery as, as, as fast as what we see in Kuala Lumpur. The recovery was quite uh, uh, fast because uh, I remember when Panda Watamo, when the price was dropped to almost 300 plus uh, thousand, mm -hmm. it recovers uh, almost 400, 500, then uh, in no time, it reaches uh, 800,000 for a terrace house. Then when it go up to 1 million, that was uh, no turning back. So that was quite fast for Klang Valley, but Johor Bahru was, was quite a unique situation. There was oversupplies of factories. Uh, there's a lot, lot of Singaporean investors at that time 
who came into Johor Bahru to invest and buy uh, uh, factories uh, 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 in quantity. So the developer also start building a lot. So a lot of Singaporeans was also caught uh, during that time. Uh, so a lot of people also lost a lot of money. So I agreed uh, with uh, 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 David or Joshua, you really need to look at uh, uh, research uh, carefully in what type of properties to invest. Uh, is it the right time to invest? Because when crisis happen, if your gearing is very high, you are going to lose a lot of money. And if your borrowing is even higher, I think that will be uh, even a setback. I remember during the 98 crisis, there was no moratorium. Uh, there's no six month moratorium. So a lot of uh, property owners actually suffer because uh, they need to pay up their loans. Mm -hmm. And the auctions or the MPLs were pretty high as well. Uh, that's why there was a, a, a government had to form a, a company called Danahata to actually absorb and acquire all the distressed property and then later auction off all these uh, uh, distressed properties. I think big properties players was also affected during that time. Huh? Uh, but they soon, uh, sooner or later, they do, did recover after this crisis. So my, my take on this is very simple. Uh, yes, invest in property, but you really need to research well what kind of property sure. and do not over gear. Uh, yes. And if can, you pay as much upfront money as possible uh, rather than taking a 90 to 80% load. Huh? Mm, and sure, the sure. take is uh, always buy somewhere near a college or university. I think that <laughs> will be a, <laughs> quite a secure investment because Nevertheless, the students will come and go, but the UST will still be there forever. Huh? Mm. The campus, you just look at areas like Star Park, you look at areas like Sunway. Uh, Sunway College has been there for uh, 20 over years. Yeah. And the condos are doing, uh, even uh, up and down, they are doing a, a consistent rental. If you are looking for investment, yes, please buy those near to UST or colleges. Rent it to students. Mm. That's okay. my thing. Yeah. So basically, you were, okay, very interesting about the, the six months moratorium as well, that this round that we have in 2020 compared to, you know, previous situations. So because of the moratorium, any the impact that you see is for six months, right? To up to September. So will uh, we slow down any impact? Cushion currently, down this moratorium six months actually to save a lot of borrowers and SME companies. I think without it, I'm sure we are already in a, in a dire situation where a lot of mm -hmm. defaulters, the bank will see a, a huge surge in MPLs uh, because of the uh, moratorium is not in place. That is what happened in 1998. So a lot of borrowers suffer because they have very high gearing, they have very high lending uh, uh, borrowing from the banks. That's why uh, when the crisis hit, the property crisis hit, uh, there's no cash actually to pay up the loan. Then a lot of property was being auctioned off during that time. So right now, we, we don't see any uh, increase in MPL because simply the government put on hold. The situation will be more clearer after the six-month uh, moratorium has been lifted. I, I believe the borrowers uh, can still apply individually for another one to two month extension, uh, depending on your financial records. Uh, mm -hmm. That definitely, I think, will help the borrower to have some breather. Uh, just to quickly add as well, right? Uh, I think when it comes to loans, uh, um, like I mentioned just now, a lot of us are hand, hand to mouth, right? Um, so yes, the six months moratorium is very good, uh, but I think it's similar to how we are managing COVID now. It's about flattening mm. the curve, right? It's about not uh, having banks facing high amounts of NPL, you know, a sudden uh, shoot up in the amount of people defaulting on, on, on their credit. Right. And this is also going to have adverse pressure on the property market or, you know, even commodities market, even, you know, consumption, you know, a public consumption in terms of goods uh, and purchases. So um, if you ask me, I think if, in, you know, if the society, it is what it is today, after six months, we'll start seeing a lot of problems. What we are having right now is just managing the, 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 the problem for now. But I think a lot of the repercussions uh, from you know the the current COVID, we'll, we will see after the six months, uh, because I think a lot of this impact is here to stay, and it will take us quite some time to get out of it. Okay, okay. Actually, one I like, I mean, an interesting question that David Ma, a point that David Ma raised earlier as well from Bandar Utama Houses in Sample, right? Three hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand, reach a million. I mean, may I ask, what sort of period was this? You know, from the three hundred thousand, I mean, I'm guessing it's at the bottom of ninety eight, then you know, to the one million. It was the bottom of 98 and beginning of 99. 
uh, that's where the property start to recover. And by 2000, actually start uh, going up already. Yes. Also, uh, I would like to give you another example. Tesa Park City was also uh, uh, launched during 1999. Uh, that was after 1998. And remember, uh, those who bought uh, condominiums or park homes, uh, I think that was the park homes in Tesa Park City. I'm sure their asset or market value uh, could have uh, triple or quadruple during that time. And you look back, if you are the few investor who bought and didn't sell uh, for the next 10 to 15 years, your property value actually appreciated by more than four times. Uh, that was 100%. Man. Yes, that is uh, because uh, Desa Park City, because that was the first ever uh, uh, landscape uh, that, that include uh, a very nice park. Uh, so that was uh, quite an interesting project. And people just go there, not because it's located in Kapong, it's because what the developer are, are doing out of the box, uh, a development landscaping, they do a lot of nice landscaping. And that's what attracts the, the buyer into that market, even after the crisis been over in 98 and when 99 was launching. So those people who bought, those people who take the opportunity to, to go into this uh, property investment, they actually make a, 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 a triple uh, back investment at that point of time. And if they look back, this is worthwhile investment. So that, that is what opportunity uh, that uh, whether Joshua or, or David Hashim has, has spoken about. It's an opportunity when there's a crisis. But of course, you must do your own research. Uh, uh, whether eh, Kapong, is it an area that is worth to invest? Or whether the developer itself is worth to invest? Or this is some thoughts for, for the buyers to, to, to ponder. Mm, sure. And then David, David Hashem, you shared, very interesting, you shared about your Ampang Jai and the first property purchase, right? But what about subsequent years, you know, during, let's say, 1998 or 2008? Any stories or opportunistic stories you could share, let's say, because I think people may be able to learn you know, from all these different decades of opportunity, how to turn this, you know, into an opportunity. Are you, are you referring to property or just in general? The property, I think, yeah. A property, yeah. You know, whenever I, whenever I decided to acquire a piece of a property, it was never, it was never just, um, you know, uh, it was always because of a connection. There was always a connection. Either, for example, I was the architect of the project. So uh -huh. there was some advantage I could get. You know, I could pick the right unit before yes. it was launched. And I would uh -huh. therefore get the right... Uh, best corner for the right price because I knew more than everybody else or because the developer was a friend of mine and I got a special uh, payment schedule. Or, or, there was always some angle. There was always some angle. Uh, for those who are, who are just uh, completely new to this game, I would say, you know, like what Daniel have said, uh, learn first, uh, make friends, uh, do your research um, and don't rush into it. I mean, there's, there's no urgency. Um, I think the market will be depressed for quite some time. I don't think we're going to have a V-shaped recovery. Uh, Daniel, Joshua, I don't th I'm sure you'll agree. Malaysia is not going to have a V-shape a recovery. It'll be a long uh, U-shaped recovery. So uh, th there, there's no rush. And a lot of uh, developers out there have got very innovative um, uh, financing schemes, mm -hmm. you know, very innovative financing schemes, uh, up to 100% financing or deferred payments and or rent to own schemes. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, options out there. Uh, and of course, there's a secondary market. Secondary market, um, uh, you know, you'll be lucky to find people who are in, in a difficult situation. Like Daniel said, within six months, we'll find out who's really struggling because those people might be the first ones to say, okay, I give up here. Uh, I'll let go of my property uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a very good deal. So in my journey of, of property purchases, and I'll admit they haven't all turned out perfectly well, um, mm. is, but they've always come with knowing more than the average purchaser. I always had an inside track uh, to what was going on. Um, mm. and, that, and I think that gives you some advantage. I, my advice is don't just you know, buy blindly. Uh, make sure you know all the angles in, in the deal before you do. Mm. Mm. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks. For that. So, okay. So, I mean, we have about 10 minutes left. So, you know, back to the topic again, recession lessons. So, we've 
got a lot of sharing, a lot of insights from David, from Daniel, from Joshua, all different types of perspective, right? So there are a lot of recession stories, a lot of, you know, um, lessons as well. So back to this point, crisis or opportunity? Maybe I will go one round to all the speakers again. Maybe we will start with uh, Joshua. Then we'll go to, you know, Daniel and David again to, to round up, right? So overall, COVID-19 to, jo to Joshua, do you see it? Crisis or opportunity? Well, what do you say in conclusion for you? Um, I, I think I've been quite consistent on this matter. And I think, you know, uh, individually, uh, I view COVID-19 as an opportunity. Uh, very much so, right? Um, but I think that stems from, you know, number one, um, making the right planning. A lot of people say, but you can't plan for these kind of things. Mm. I agree to a certain extent, but you can plan to make uh, you know, uh, have contingencies uh, for, for certain extents, right? So like, like for me and my company, you know, um, we're a small company, uh, 17 people, right? Uh, but from my experience working in PwC, I have a BCP plan in place. BCP is a business contingency planning um, of, you know, how, how to continue business uh, if, if things go bad, right? So uh, I have that in place, even though we're a very small company. Right, uh, I make good financial decisions, so I'm not over geared. Right, uh, I I do not make decisions with three months uh, ahead. You know, I, I see six, nine, maybe even twelve months ahead, even eighteen months ahead. But right? I think all comes from also uh, learning and speaking to your network of people that are more experienced, people that have been there, done that. You know, having the humility to accept that. You know, we need to learn. Uh, I think. Um, we need to have those type of uh, man mindset and mentality in order for us to, you know, uh, learn from such situation and capitalize on any opportunities that we have. Um, and for me, I think as a young person, uh, it's an opportunity because um, this type of scenarios or this type of crisis gives people that um, before this, you know, have a lot of consideration, say, oh, I can't leave my job, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that because of this and that. Now, all, all of a sudden, maybe they don't have, you know, need to consider these um, considerations as much anymore. They can go ahead and say, you know what, heck with it because, you know, I have nothing to lose anymore. Why don't I just go and do what I think, you know, it's going to work and, 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 and take that risk, right? But, um, uh, you know, um, finally as well, I think like what Mr. David Hashim said, I think entrepreneurs, we're not gambling. We, we take calculated risk. And when we say calculated risk, it's because we learn about what we want to do. We equip ourselves with the knowledge and skill sets to go and approach um, the, the, whatever we're trying to do. So whether are we going to guarantee success, there's no guarantee in lives. I've learned that the only guarantees are taxes and death. That are two things that are definitely guaranteed. But everything else, uh, you know, you, you need to make sure that you make good decisions by uh, making good planning. And that will include learning, speaking to the right people, having the right attitude, uh, and keep a hus uh, hustling mindset, right? I keep hustling and keep going every single day. So that, that would be my intake uh, or, you know, my sure. take. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Then we'll go to Daniel, right? So Daniel, overall, you know, for you, you know, based on your experiences, you know, in 97, 2000 and today, do you see this pandemic, COVID-19, is it a crisis or opportunity overall? To me, or my personal opinion, I think it's both. It's both a crisis and also it's both opportunity. Let's start with crisis. I think mm. no doubts we are living in an unprecedented uh, historical event mm. that nothing of such scale has ever happened in our lifetime. Mm. Uh, that was the last crisis. It was worse than this was the 1918 pandemic uh, Spanish flu. This is quite equivalent to that. But this is quite a, a, a worse event because it actually uh, put all the global economy to a standstill, which means that the economy cannot operate and function during this two to three months crisis. Uh, uh, and then a lot of businesses, uh, whether you are in the hotel, hospitality or retail or in the manufacturing sector, all these are, are totally come to a standstill, uh, which means you cannot operate your business. I think the business owners will suffer. Uh, the employees for those uh, working in those sectors will also suffer. Um, so that is a crisis to them. Uh, but to, to those who are opportunities, who find the way out of doing, doing this uh, crisis, are those who are the winners. Uh, that could be people are looking when 
for example, you have property you would like to let go at the price that is below the market value because you just want to offload. And the people who buy from you during this crisis are the winners because you already offload at a, a, a special discount below 10 to 20% of the market value. And the people who buy, I call these are the opportunities because they are buying below the market value. So when things do recover, uh, maybe on a U shape, uh, it's probably in a uh, 12 months time or 18 months time, you see that the prices that you pay off is just 10 to 20% lower. So that is the opportunity for some who are looking for, to, to look out for a cheap and, uh, and a more uh, lesser price uh, that what they can't buy during the uh, uh, better times. Uh, so this is my take on it. So this is also a crisis but also an opportunity for time to really look into some of the uh, cheap properties that may be up for sale, uh, not necessarily after the moratorium. Uh, some people will, will can't wait, will try to offload their properties. You can, as I mentioned that most of the hotel uh, owners are looking to shut down temporarily or permanently. So there will be a lot of uh, 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 desperate selling by some of the owners in this industry, whether it's their budget shop houses, hotels, uh, whether is it a, 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 a building. So if you're looking for those investments, I mean, this is the right time to negotiate with the owners uh, to get a better price. When the time recover, the time will definitely recover because this flu will definitely uh, be over in a matter of time. Nobody knows. Uh, we all know when the vaccine is available, this crisis will definitely be come to an end. Uh, as long as the vaccine is not uh, yet up in the market, the, the virus will still be there. Uh, so the impact will, will nevertheless will still uh, cause a, a, a bit of a shake up. But uh, eventually this will go off. All crises will come to an end and economy still have to, to, to pick up again. You can see China is recovering uh, after a, a strict three months of lockdown. So things are picking up. Uh, this is my take. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. So, David Hashem, before we ask you that last question, crisis of opportunity, right? I'd like to ask you something different as well before we go to the last question. I mean, earlier you shared your experience in 1987, right? You decided to you know, start your own business. So today, right, for let's say for a person, whether number one, they are a fresh graduate out of, out of university and they find it hard to get a job or people who are retrenched, etc. Would you advise them to, you know, perhaps start their own business? It, it, would you? In this type of time, or this type of era, I mean, would it be something as well that they could do? Uh, necessity is often the mother of invention. Uh, in my case, it was sort of the same thing that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, back then and now are two different uh, times. It's very different today. It's much harder, much more competitive. It costs much more to start a business than it did 33 years ago. Mm. So my advice is not to not to follow my footsteps and immediately start a business. I was very lucky. Um, mm. uh, to most young graduates, I say gain some experience, uh, mm. build some capital. When I say capital, I don't m necessarily mean financial capital. Uh, capital in terms of networks of friends mm. and relationships and connections and, and not as much money as well. Mm. So um, not not necessarily. But if you can't get a job or you've just been retrenched and you have no other choice right now you can continue to apply uh daniel was very resilient he finally uh for after some time he managed to find a job and i would say continue to pursue that but in the meantime don't just sit on your ass and and uh, you know cry into your pillow that you can't find a job there are so many ways to uh be of value to the world even from your 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 ipad or your desktop or laptop so i would uh, do both you know don't just sit and wait. Uh, you can be of value in somewhere to somebody. To somebody. And in, in wrapping up, um, I would, uh, I think everyone here, uh, the, the two earlier speakers have said everything that needs to be said. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say one more thing though. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing right now as we, is, to, is, is for you to be safe and well. And I say that that's the most important message I'm giving to the audience here, because if you're not keeping your, if you're not avoiding getting sick, mm -hmm. all right, that could be the worst thing. If you think there's a crisis, if you get sick tomorrow, there's going to be even a much bigger crisis in your life. So uh, follow all the regulations and of social distancing and everything else. 
-hmm. keep yourself safe because if you're if you you know without that <laughs> the, the situation is going to be much worse mm -hmm. but as long as you can keep yourself safe and and well um like what i said in my opening statement human nature always thinks we're in such a deep shithole we'll never get out it's not true it's not true uh you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger they say and if you get out of this uh alive with anything you know with a shirt on your back you are going to be a success going forward oh, sure. Thank you very much to all the speakers, David Hashim, Daniel Ma, and Joshua Tan, for all your sharing insights and perspective. To all the viewers, thank you very much for also watching the DJS FB Live. I'm David Xie Chong. Till we meet again. Thank you all. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Bye bye. Take care.